Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I told first service that I'm trying to find different ways to say good morning, everybody, like different inflection every week, and they didn't think that was amusing. Uh, today we are going to continue looking at uh, the story we've been discussing for the past several weeks as we make our way through uh, the book of 1 Samuel. So we will pick up the story at verse 24 of chapter 14. So you can open your Bibles and join me there. If you don't have one, if you put your hand up, someone will bring you a Bible from the back. We are at 1 Samuel 14, 24. But to remind you where we are in the story, the Israelites were subject to the Philistines. But the Philistines mostly left the Israelites alone as long as they didn't make trouble. But Jonathan, son of King Saul, made trouble. He provoked the Philistines, and the Philistines gathered this gigantic army to retaliate. And the battle lines were drawn up, but Israel had no chance of victory. They were massively outnumbered, and they didn't have any weapons. So the army was deserting. They were running away. They were hiding and the Philistines were sending raiding parties into the Israelite towns, and nobody could do anything to stop them. Saul, the king, was hiding under a tree, hoping probably that the Philistines would just lose interest and go away. But Jonathan and his armor bearer, knowing God, that God could save by many or by few, that the numbers and the odds don't matter to God, and that maybe God would act through them, they made themselves available to be used by God. They went over to the Philistine camp. God stepped in and gave Jonathan and his armor bearer success. God sent an earthquake and panic on the Philistines. Panic so bad that they began attacking each other and they flew into retreat. And after a few mistakes, King Saul finally got the army going into battle and pursued the Philistines who were retreating. They were joined by the, the hiders and the deserters, and they began to mop up the Philistine army as they ran away from the panic that God had caused. And that's where we join the story this week. And just to let you know ahead of time, no, King Saul is not going to come off any better in this part of the story. Because Saul's going to Saul. Verse 24 says, chapter 14, verse 24. Now, the men of Israel were in distress that day because Saul had bound the people under an oath saying, cursed be any man who eats food before evening comes, before I have avenged myself on my enemies. So none of the troops tasted food. So, Jonathan had stepped out boldly in faith, had made himself available to be used by God, and as a result, God did use Jonathan as the tip of the spear in the deliverance for the people of Israel. The Philistines are running away, and now it's the job of the rest of the Israelite army under King Saul to chase them down and finish up the job. But before Saul sends the troop after the Philistines, he made them all take an oath that they wouldn't eat anything until the Philistines were defeated or else they would be under a curse. Now, of course, this action from King Saul is going to prove problematic, as we'll see in a minute. As we'll see, it is a bad vow. But when you just look at it, on the surface, it seems so spiritual. We're going to let God do this great thing today, guys. We're going to make this a special day, a day of fasting to the Lord. It seems so pious. And oh yeah, by the way, I'm going to make everybody do this under threat of a curse. Now, of course, the king, King Saul, the secular leader, had no authority to pronounce religious curses on the people. That was the job of the spiritual leader, Samuel, or even Ahijah, who is in the camp with the army acting as high priest at this point. But no, what happens yet again 
is that Saul, the secular leader, invades the area of authority of the religious leader, violating God's pattern and binding the men under an oath and a curse. And in addition to that, we see that Saul's motives and his focus were wrong. Look what he says. He binds them under this oath until I have avenged myself on my enemies. Well, hold on right there. Were the Philistines just Saul's enemies? Was this battle only about Saul? How about this? Did Saul even start this battle? Who is this oath about? Even though this thing that he did seems spiritual, this oath, Saul makes it all about himself, not about God, because it is binding until Saul gets his vengeance. He put the focus back on himself. See, Jonathan acted in great faith, believing that maybe God would do a great thing and that if God did, God would get the glory for it. But no one was going to be thinking about Jonathan's brave, faithful act or God's provision because their hunger and their fear of the curse would make them think about Saul. And it says that the men of Israel were in distress that day because of the oath. It was an unnecessary, stupidly bad oath to force them to make because now they would have nothing to eat all day in battle. Saul made the army weak and discouraged to put the focus on himself when they needed to be strong and fueled and ready to go. The job of mopping up after and pursuing a fleeing enemy is a difficult task. It is an exhausting pursuit, searching with maximum energy all day long. And as we know from current events, it is difficult to search all day long and find what you're looking for. At the end of the day, the Israelite army was tired and hungry. Just think how you would feel after a full day of chasing and searching for the enemy, up and down hills, through streams, in and out of forests, through the underbrush, with no food all day. You'd be exhausted. You'd be demoralized. And so were they. Because of Saul's bad vow. They needed food to give them the energy they needed to finish the fight. And verse 25 says, the entire army entered the woods and there was honey on the ground. When they went into the woods, they saw the honey oozing out, yet no one put his hand to his mouth because they feared the oath. So they came into the woods and there was honey there. This was God providing food for the army. Honey would have given them fast energy that they needed to keep pursuing the Philistines. But no one ate any of the honey. No one ate any of God's provision because they were afraid of the king's bad vow. In truth, because of the king's bad vow, they didn't even see God's blessing as God's blessing, even though it was right in front of them. But, verse 27, but Jonathan had not heard that his father had bound the people with the oath. So he reached out the end of his staff that was in his hand and dipped it into the honeycomb. He raised his hand to his mouth and his eyes brightened. Then one of the soldiers told him, your father bound the army under a strict oath saying, cursed be any man who eats food today. That's why the men are faint. Jonathan said, my father has made trouble for the country. See how my eyes brightened when I tasted a little of this honey? How much better it would have been if the men had eaten today some of the plunder they took from their enemies. Would not the slaughter of the Philistines had been even greater? So, Jonathan hadn't heard the bad vow. This also means that Jonathan didn't bind himself to the oath. And the reason for that is because Jonathan was off being used by God instead of hiding under a tree. But because he was off following God, he missed the bad vow and he, eat, he eats some of the honey provided by God. And immediately he is refreshed and refueled and recharged, ready to go for God. 
God's provision worked. He had the energy he needed to continue the fight. But then right after that happens, one of the soldiers explains to him that the king had bound them with an oath and a curse not to do what Jonathan just did. And Jonathan, like Adam Sandler and the wedding singer, is probably thinking, once again, things that could have been brought to my attention yesterday. Seriously, why wait until after he eats the honey? Why not stop Jonathan before he ate the honey? Well, that's probably because all the men knew that Jonathan wasn't part of the oath because Jonathan wasn't there when it happened. So the soldier is just explaining to Jonathan why the rest of them aren't joining in eating the honey with him. And then Jonathan criticizes his father's bad vow, which I will admit is not the best look to undercut the king's authority in front of the troops. That's not the greatest decision. But in fairness to Jonathan, he was right. It was a dumb and unnecessary thing to do. It was a selfish thing on Saul's part to make the troops take this oath. And like Jonathan said, the victory would have been even greater if they had been allowed to eat during the day, to have some sort of fuel instead of being faint. It was a bad vow. But like happens with most of the stories about Saul in the Bible, the hits just keep on coming. Because verse 31 says, that day after the Israelites had struck down the Philistines from Michmash to Aijalon, they were exhausted. They pounced on the plunder and taking sheep, cattle, and calves, they butchered them on the ground and ate them together with the blood. So at the end of the day, the men were so hungry and so exhausted that they took some of the animals that they had captured from the Philistines, killed them, and ate them. But the law of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 12 gives specific instructions to always drain the blood from an animal before eating it. The men were so hungry that they did not take the time to do this. They were so hungry because of Saul's bad vow that they violated the command of God. It's actually possible that in this story, the men are eating the meat raw. Saul's bad vow caused the men to sin. Verse 33, Then someone said to Saul, Look, the men are sinning against Yahweh by eating meat that has blood in it. You have broken faith, he said. Roll a large stone over here at once. Then he said, Go out among the men and tell them, Each of you bring me your cattle and sheep and slaughter them here and eat them. Do not sin against Yahweh by eating meat with blood still in it. So everyone brought his ox that night and slaughtered it there. Then Saul built an altar to Yahweh. It was the first time he had done this. So, to keep the men from sinning as the result of his bad vow, King Saul built an altar. Let me say that again. King Saul built an altar and commanded that the animals be brought there and properly butchered. Once again, this is not something that is under the authority of the king. To set up an altar is under the authority of the religious leader. But Saul doesn't ask the priest to do this, even though the high priest was there in the camp. Saul built the altar. Saul once again invaded the authority of the religious leader. So, as a result of a bad vow, Saul himself has violated God's order. Verse 36 says, Saul said, let's go down after the Philistines by night and plunder them till dawn and let's not leave one of them alive. Do whatever seems best to you, they replied. But the priest said, let's inquire of God here. So after the violations of God's word, the men are now fed. Saul wants to continue the pursuit of the Philistines through the night. And the priests say, hey bud, you might want to check that out with God first. And in this part of the story, the priests may be trying to grab back a little bit of the religious authority that Saul is stealing away from them. And the priest is right. It was good for Saul to seek the will of God. He should have done this any number of times up to this point in the story. He didn't, but now he decides to. So we can give Saul credit there. But verse 37 says, Saul asked God, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you give them into Israel's hand? 
But God did not answer him that day. God made no response. Now, it's possible that if the priests are using the Urim and the Thummim to de determine the will of God like they do later on in the story, it may be that they start by asking if God wants to talk. And they keep pulling out the stone that represents no. Or it may be that God is just completely silent. God answers our prayers, yes, no, and wait. And sometimes there may be no answer at all. And in such cases, when God seems to be silent, the best course of action is caution. To draw close to God and continue to seek him and his will and wait for him to speak. That's not what Saul does. Saul becomes indignant. Verse 38, Saul therefore said, Come here, all you who are leaders of the army, and let's find out what sin has been committed today. As surely as Yahweh, who rescues Israel, lives, even if it lies with my son Jonathan, he must die. But not one of them then said a word. So Saul assumed that God's silence is because God is upset with somebody in the Israelite camp who has sinned. So he sets out to find out who the guilty party is and declared that whoever it is is going to die. Once again, Saul steps in, swears a bad vow, and usurps the authority of the religious leaders by deciding what must be done because God is silent. Saul is great at making religious-sounding vows, but none of them come from a real understanding or a real respect or real faith in God. And in response to all of the king's bluster, whoever did this was going to die, no one responded. Why? When the king says, whoever sinned is going to die, why does no one respond? Because they all had sinned that night. They violated God's command about the preparation of the meat. Saul violated God's order by stealing the authority of the religious leader. Before this, none of them but Jonathan had, had, had trusted God enough to come out from under their hiding tree. There's plenty of reason at this point in the story why God might be silent. But then there's this little switch in the story that happens. Saul usurps the priest's authority and instructs them to use the Urim and the Thummim to find out who is at fault. And they do. And Jonathan is the one who is chosen. Now, at this point in the story, we have to stop and ask ourselves what's going on here because if you, when you look at it, if they're asking the question, who in the camp has sinned against God? The answer is pretty much everybody but Jonathan. Saul's making bad vows. He's forcing others by curse into bad vows. He's uh, violating the proper area of his authority and stealing authority from the religious leader. He's being selfish. In, you know, in general, Saul is going to Saul. Uh, the men have violated God's command by how to properly butcher the meat. At this point in the story, Jonathan's biggest offense is going off to follow God without telling anyone and criticizing his father's vow that was bad in front of the men. So we should ask ourselves when we come to this point in the story, why is Jonathan chosen? See, they must be asking who violated the oath. Not simply just who sinned. Because if they ask God who sinned, that doesn't narrow it down at all. But Jonathan did violate the oath. Kinda. He, he did what the men vowed not to do upon curse. But Jonathan wasn't there when the oath was taken. Jonathan didn't make the vow with the men. But Jonathan did eat some of the honey. When we come to this point in the story, it may also be here, you can see that God knows what he's doing. See, it may be that God looks at the situation that is happening here with the army of Israel, where Saul is making bad vows, the vows are spiraling out of control, the king is threatening to kill people, even, if, even his own son. Seeing the outcome of where this is going, God moves to stop this episode of bad vows. Because when Jonathan is chosen, 
Saul demands to know what Jonathan did. And Jonathan confessed that he ate some of the honey. And Jonathan accepted responsibility for that action, even though he was not present and did not make the oath with the men. And when we see what Jonathan does here, we should ask ourselves how many of us in such a situation would respond as honorably as Jonathan does. Would we respond like Jonathan, or will we get upset and start shouting about how unfair the situation is? That we weren't even there when the oath was taken, so we shouldn't be held responsible or accountable to it. That it was a bad vow to begin with, so to insist that we die for it is ridiculous. How many of us would get upset and say, I didn't take that oath, so it shouldn't be binding on me? Not Jonathan. Jonathan is willing to take responsibility for his action because he's an honorable man. Even the unfair responsibility for his action. Because Jonathan is an honorable man. He's one, he's a person that we should strive to be like, especially the men in this room, to take responsibility for our actions, to trust God. That's why Jonathan responded like he did, because he trusts God. He went over and, and fought the Philistines because he trusted God. He trusts God whatever outcome happened over there. Now that he's back in the Israelite camp, he trusts God with whatever outcome happens here. Jonathan trusts God. Saul, on the other hand, showed no mercy. He said, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if you do not die, Jonathan. Saul was willing to kill his own son rather than admit that he was to blame for the bad vow. Because Saul was going to Saul. But like I said, God knows what he's doing. Because, verse 45, the men said to Saul, should Jonathan die? He who has brought about this great deliverance in Israel? Never. As surely as Yahweh lives, not a hair on his head will fall to the ground, for he did this today with God's help. So the men rescued Jonathan, and he was not put to death. So the men rebel against King Saul's decision that Jonathan must die. Saul made a bad vow and forced that vow upon the men with a curse because he wanted the focus on him. It was his battle, his vengeance. But God arranged the events, even through Saul messing up, to bring the focus back to where it should be. The men pointed out that God had acted through Jonathan, not the king, to deliver Israel from impossible odds. That Jonathan was the hero who had trusted God, not Saul, and that they weren't going to let Saul kill him. Even though there were bad vows made by the king, and they make the story a mess. Things get messed up in this story because of what King Saul does through bad vows to put the focus on himself. Even though all that happens, God brought the focus for the men back to where it should be. Jonathan trusted God, and God delivered them from overwhelming odds against the superior force of the Philistines. Saul tried to put the focus on himself. But God knows what he's doing, and God got the glory for what happened. And then verse 46 says, Then Saul stopped pursuing the Philistines, and they withdrew to their own land. Saul gave up, dropped the matter. He didn't learn anything. He didn't see how dumb his bad vow was. He didn't see the error in invading the authority of the religious leaders that was not his to have. He sends the troop home, and the Philistines got away. And the rest of the chapter tells us that Saul's reign as king was one of constant war from every side. That he was successful in some places, but he was never fully successful against the Philistines. And because the Bible puts this note that he was never fully successful against the Philistines, right here at the end of the story about this bad vow we can connect the constant war with the Philistines to the bad vow in this story. Maybe Jonathan was right. If it had not been for the king's bad vow, God's victory would have been even greater. 
But Saul doesn't trust God. Saul doesn't rely on God. Saul is not a godly man. Saul relies on the strength and wisdom of man rather than faith in God. Jonathan relies on faith in God. Now, what can we learn from this story? Lesson number one. Once again, we see problems arise when spheres of authority are not respected. In particular, when the secular authority invades and attempts to take over the religious authority, bad things happen. The Bible teaches us that the religious should guide and influence the secular, not the other way around. And the secular certainly shouldn't try to usurp the authority of the religious. Now, I completely understand that people get nervous. Sometimes people get nervous when the pastor starts saying things like this, saying things like the religious should guide and influence the secular. I know that we get, you know, we get nervous when the pastor says Christians should influence politics. And things like even our secular government must govern by the principles set forth in the word of God. I know that people get nervous when the pastor says that, even if it is true. And the, the, they might even accuse the pastor of advocating for theocracy, rule by God. What a concept. But what we see when we look around is actually we see more often the other way. We see the secular constantly infringing on the authority of the religious. The state thinking they have authority over the church. Now, I would be willing to argue and put forth the case that the reason we see that is because we don't really have a religious sphere and a secular sphere here in America anymore. What we actually have is two competing religious authorities. And that both of them want theocracy. They just have different theos, different gods in mind. Our secular authority has become every bit as religious as the church, sometimes even more so in our culture. And I know that some of you may watch the news and hear things, and you might be nervous that the secular authority, however religious they are, may attempt to try to overstep and invade the authority of the religious again, like they did three years ago. Let me just say that if that happens, like three years ago, Cornerstone will remain open. The religious authority is to guide and influence the secular, not the other way around. Lesson number two, don't make bad vows. Is that simple enough for you? Don't make promises that are unwise. Be careful what you say. We tend to give our word or make promises or even pronounce oaths and vows and curses without even thinking about it. Have you ever, have you ever heard yourself say, I swear to God? You know what you just did when you said that? You swore a bad vow. Be careful with your words. Ecclesiastes says that it's better not to make a vow than to make one and not keep it. Don't make a promise you know you can't keep. Be careful with your words, because bad vows have consequences. A bad vow can make you miss God's blessing. The men in today's story did not see God's blessing and provision, the honey, as God's blessing and provision, even though it was right in front of them. They missed what was right in front of their face. Do you feel like God isn't blessing you? or God isn't providing for you? Maybe your words, maybe a bad vow is distorting your vision. Maybe you don't even know it. Maybe God's blessing and God's provision is right there in front of your face, but you don't see it because your vow has made you miss it. Be careful with your words. Because bad vows have consequences. A bad vow can lead to sin. In today's text, Saul's bad vow caused the whole army to sin by eating meat butchered in the wrong way. And if your bad vow causes another person to sin, God is going to hold you accountable for that. God will hold, hold that person accountable who did the wrong thing, yes. But he's also going to hold the person who made the bad vow wrong or accountable as well. So be careful with your words. 
In today's text, Saul's bad vow made Saul sin too. So don't make bad vows or lead others into them or push others into them because sinful behaviors can result from bad vows. Be careful with your words. Jesus told us the solution to all this in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus tells us the solution. He said, don't swear an oath at all. Simply yet let your yes be yes and your no be no. Jesus said the solution is to just be a person of your word. Tell the truth. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Be careful with your words. Jesus went on to say, any more than that, any more than just being a person of your word is from the evil one. If you go beyond simply being a person of your word, you're going to get yourself in trouble, as today's story illustrates. One little step away from God, one bad vow, one careless word can snowball out of control. So be careful with your words. And lesson three, be like Jonathan. Don't be a Saul. Saul is selfish and insecure. He doesn't take responsibility when he does something wrong. He wants all the focus on himself and he doubles down to the point of being willing to kill his own son instead of admitting that he did the wrong thing. Don't be a Saul. Live like Jonathan. Jonathan trusts God. Jonathan chooses to be available to God. Jonathan boldly steps out and follows God. A lot of us could do with boldly stepping out and following God. Jonathan is an honorable man and takes responsibility for his actions, even if he faces unfair consequences because of them. He can do all that because his faith is firmly rooted in God. In knowing that nothing can stop God. That the odds and the numbers and the odds don't matter to God. Jonathan really believes that. Be like Jonathan. So, to summarize today's lessons for you. Respect and live by proper God-ordained order of authority. Be people of your word. Tell the truth. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Live honorable lives. And trust God.